So it's a Wednesday afternoon, and you're still at the conference, uh, which is admirable. Um, that's probably because it's a week-long conference. But um, thank you for coming. So uh, when I was a kid, I wanted to be an astronaut. Um, this, this, the presentation this morning reinforced this desire. Um, like every kid in the 80s, I grew up with pictures of Voyager on my walls uh, in my bedroom. And I ended up instead working on this kind of stuff. So talk about a failure in life. Um, so, uh, like most of you, um, well, probably unlike most of you in some, in the, some aspects, but uh, I work on a code base that needs a lot of refactoring. So we're probably a lot, of, a lot similar in that respect. Um, and so I spend my time cutting the Gordian knot over and over and over again. Um, and this talk is going to be how we solve that problem uh, at scale at Google, right? So I work on a team uh, with Titus Winters, who spoke this morning about style, and several other people are here at this conference. And we are responsible for uh, improving and maintaining Google's code base as a whole. Uh, and lots of that involves refactoring all of the ugly bits to be less ugly. So what is refactoring? Um, this is the Fowler definition. And this is the most text that I will have on a slide this entire talk. So you don't actually have to read it. Right? Um, refactoring is not this. Okay? Um, this is changing the British spelling to English spelling in comments, right? This is not refactoring. Um, there are so many other fish to fry that someone who comes to me and says, this is what I want to do, you know, point your cannon at this problem, and I will turn the cannon back around at them, um, because this is not the problem we're trying to solve here. Um, we're trying to solve problems like this, right? So consider this uh, class. It has a static method uh, named join path, right? It joins a couple of paths together, does what you would expect, except it doesn't do what you would expect, right? Um, if the second argument is an absolute path, it completely ignores the first argument, right? Now, you may imagine that there are uses for this, and you would be right, uh, but most people don't expect that behavior. Uh, also, the fact that we're using file as a namespace, right, is also kind of a, a scary thing. This actually predates our use of namespaces at Google, right? So you can envision we want a better API, and indeed we have one that looks something like this. This is C11. Uh, we've, we now have two APIs, join path, join path absolute. Uh, join path, which is smaller and easier to type, uh, is what most people mean to do, right? And that's why it's smaller and easier to type. Uh, join path absolute does preserve the original semantics. Great. So now we have uh, three APIs instead of one. Life is a whole lot better. <laughs> Not so, right? So the question is, how do we get everybody from the top form to the bottom form? Right? This is changing a capital F to a lowercase f. And oh, there are 50,000 callers in your code base. Right? Um, you can't make this change or, uh, with a human. Right? You have to have some tooling. Um, and oh, by the way, some of them might migrate to this form. Right? They might prefer the absolute behavior. How do you know? Right? Uh, again, you can't have a human investigate all 50,000 callers to this, this method. Uh, you have to make this determination with automatic tooling. And oh, by the way, right, the new API is very attic. So in cases where we have a nested call like this, we'd like to collapse those all into a single method call. Right? These are all reasonable things to want to do to, clear, to, to improve a code base uh, to make it better. Right? Um, what gets hard is doing it at very, very large scale. Uh, another example. right? So this is a a uh, string manipulation improvement that we have, right? So the old API looks something like this at the top, split string using. It takes an output parameter, uh, which if you, we all learned from Chandler a couple days ago is bad, you should never do that, right? So we have a new API called string split, which has actually been written up as a proposal to one of the, the libraries in standard. Um, and it returns something like, uh, it returns its output by value, right? Um, and it has this, the original semantic was use any of those delimiters. Um, and this new API takes a predicate, so we can put the any of predicate, right? So we maintain semantics. But oh, by the way, if there's only one delimiter, we want to drop that any of because it's implicit, it's or it's superfluous. You'd only need one, um, right? This seems pretty easy. You just strike the semicolon and change the name of the function you're calling, right? Easy, right? Not so. Uh, what if we have things like this, right? Uh, the second example, v2 is being used inside of an if statement, right? No longer just as easy as striking the semicolon and moving the, the function call up a line. Um, we now have to do some data flow analysis, 
right, to actually make this change. And by the way, there's 30,000 of these in your code base. Right? How are you going to do this? Um, other, way, other refactorings that we want to do, right? Some are just code health improvements. Uh, so this is uh, f is a unique pointer called dot get, and then dereference it using either the star operator or the error operator, right? This uh, both looks bad and you know, just isn't the right way to use this, this type of type. You can get rid of that stuff um, very automatically. Um, we actually don't even bother doing this anymore because we have other tools that we can, we can use to surface this. Um, and here is a bona fide bug, right? This is the one example of non-constant references uh, that causes, or non-constant references in uh, Google 3, or Google's code base, um, that uh, does cause a bug, right? So um, if you know it on the top version, you're going to get dangling, a dangling reference, right? On the bottom version, you can, we can detect this condition, right? In the top, it's easy to detect but how do you actually fix it, right? We can fix this bug using the bottom version. The question to all these is, is it going to scale, right? So we can do all these by hand, but is it going to scale? And this is the, this is the second half of the title, right? How are we refactoring at scale, right? So like most of you who, uh, again, grow up, grew up in the American educational system in the 80s, this is how you learn to count. Um, these should look fairly familiar, so let's count, let's start counting that way, right? So when we're refactoring, one thing, right? This is actually isn't even refactoring. Like, don't even come talk to me. Um, just make the change and be done with it, right? Um, don't even worry about it. Ten, ten instances, right? You have ten callers, ten variables, whatever you're refactoring. Um, you, same type of deal, right? It takes you an hour instead of ten minutes, but you just do it um, and move on. Okay, so hundred callers, right? Um, this gets actually kind of annoying. Uh, maybe you write a couple of uh, sed scripts, or maybe you uh, write some Emacs macros or some Vim macros. Maybe you decide that you're going to get some repetitive stress injury that day and uh, do it all by hand. But at the end of the day, you do this, it's a bad day, and then you move on, right? Um, so a thousand instances. Uh, this starts to get really annoying. Maybe you enlist some colleagues to help you. Um, this is kind of like the five stages of grief kick in here, right? So um, <laughs> denial, you know, I can't believe we actually have to do this, uh, right? All the way to acceptance, like this is going to be a terrible month, um, <laughs> right? But, but you, you invest some time in tooling uh, to get it done, but it still is, is not something that's, I mean, it's, it's hard, but not yet to the point where you spend a bunch of time and effort building a proper solution, right? This is 10,000 callers. Right? At this point, things start to get really, really interesting because it starts becoming worth the effort to build a proper solution to, doing a large -scale refa to solving the large-scale refactoring problem. Right? Um, at this point, you can invest some time and energy into <laughs> building a system that scales to this many callers. And you know, why not more, right? Uh, 100,000. Um, it turns out that the solutions for 10,000 callers uh, are largely applicable to 10,000 call or 100,000 callers. Once you get to that point, uh, you can kind of turn the crank and keep going. Um, lots of the tooling that I will talk about actually isn't the limiting factor anymore. There are underlying problems that I will talk about that, that turn out to be the issues. But the tooling that generate the changes um, actually isn't hard anymore once you get to this sort of order of magnitude type of scale. All right. So, a little bit about Google's environment, right? So I've alluded to several, several things about what makes this interesting. Um, and incidentally, uh, at Google we like to say like we're different, you know, we're special, whatever. Uh, you, the hope is that your company gets here, right? Um, if you only have 10,000 lines of code at all, or 100,000 lines of code, like presumably your company is trying to grow, and by growing you're writing software, and hopefully you get to a point at which you do have a million, 10 million, 100 million lines of code, right? So if you don't figure out how to solve these types of problems now, right, they will become existential problems for your company in 5, 10, 15 years, right? Um, I'm not saying you have to go build a bazooka to, to tackle a simple problem today, but you need to be thinking about how are we going to solve these issues. Um, and I, part of what I'm trying to do now is describe how we have solved those issues in an effort to kind of seed those thoughts, right? So Google's environment. 
Uh, one monolithic code base. Um, this is actually a lie. Uh, we have um, mostly a one monolithic code base. Um, things like uh, open source projects like Android and, and Chrome obviously have their own repositories that they work in. Um, but most of the code that I'm responsible or we're responsible for uh, lives in a single source code repository. Um, what that means is that we can reason about it as a whole, right? We can spend time thinking about this code base. As a whole, we can use the indexing tools that uh, Ty's referred to earlier um, to think about where are all my callers, which classes are overriding which classes, where are all these, where, are function, where is this function referenced, um, who's using it as a function pointer instead of a um, actual invoking it as a caller, right? Where is this thing being used as a forward declaration? All these types of questions can be answered because we have a very nice index over a single monolithic code base. Um, there are 4,000 plus C++ engineers working in this code base today, uh, concurrently. Um, something like 30,000 changes happen a day uh, in our code base. Now, those are across different, many different languages, but uh, the point being that this is a code base that is continually changing, right? So there's no such thing as everyone go home from the weekend, I'm going to do my change, and then everyone can come back on Monday and like, continue with life, right? We just can't turn off Google uh, for any period of time, right? And the same thing works with our code base, right? This is continually mutating. And so any solution that we have has to be able to work in the face of uh, people continuing to modify the code base. Um, there's over 100 million lines of code that have been written over the course of 15 plus years. And what this, what this means is that uh, it's been written using a number of different compilers uh, and style guides and uh, people, right? Uh, that best practices in industry have continued to evolve, and so as a result, uh, the code is, has an interesting flavor to it, right? <laughs> um, the vintage 2000, or 2001 code feels different than the vintage 2014 code, right? Um, and part of what we're trying to do is make that so it's not the case, so it all feels like 2014 code. Um, all changes are subject to review before commit, right? So this gets important, hopefully, Hopefully everyone in here is using some type of code review, right? Uh, Post-commit, pre-commit, I don't care, but some, you should be using code review. At Google, we use uh, pre-commit code review, which means that the person making the change has to get somebody else to sign off on that change, uh, and there's some guidance on who that should be, but they have to get someone else to sign off on that change before it actually gets submitted, right? This actually becomes uh, important to take into consideration when you're designing a large-scale refactoring strategy, right? Uh, we have this massive testing and continuous integration infrastructure. Um, so all the stuff I'm talking about in terms of tooling presupposes that you have the ability to test your changes before the heat death of the universe, right? So uh, this infrastructure that we're using allows us to uh, make a change, test that change, test all the code that depends on that change transitively, right? So um, I can see if like my change in some deep dark library broke some dependency far off in the, in the dependency graph. Uh, that turns out to be really useful when people are doing very interesting things with your deep dark library. Um, in large part, we prefer standard, uh, the standard solutions over homegrown solutions. Right? This is actually a hard ideal to maintain, um, and we don't always do it all the time because sometimes our homegrown solutions are better tailored to our infrastructure. Uh, but if we can, we want to prefer standard stuff over the homegrown stuff. And what that means, or sorry, and the final thing is we want consistency, right? That's the prime directive of our code base, is being consistent across all things, right? Across, across the code base. Um, and again, I'm simplifying. We are pragmatic in that if there's a, a reasonable reason to break su such consistency, um, that is certainly allowed. But by and large, we want to be consistent across our code base uh, for a number of important reasons, um, which, again, see, reference Titus has talked about style earlier today for that. Uh, what this means is that if we have a bunch of code that was written pre-C++11 or was written with an old API and we want to be consistent internally throughout the code base, it means that we need to be able to migrate all of the old stuff to all of the new stuff if we're going to be using any of the new stuff, right? So part of the proposal for adopting a new feature or new API is a migration plan, right? And I'm kind of simplifying in that there are compelling reasons not to have a migration plan. But, lot, but most times, part of the argument of we can use this new thing is we have a migration plan right, to get there so that we can eventually turn the old thing off. 
Um, if we're just adding a new API, we haven't actually solved any problems, particularly because the way that people write code today is find something that looks similar, copy it, and paste it, right? Uh, and if you haven't fixed the source of the copy and paste, right, you haven't actually fixed your problem. Um, so there are a number of ways that you can solve this refactoring problem. Um, there are also a number of ways that you can't solve this refactoring problem. Um, one of them is doing it by hand, right? You just can't refactor 30,000 function calls by hand. Like, you just can't do it. Um, your hands fall off by the time that you get to about 500, right? Um, so that's out of the question. Um, you can't do it by regular expression either. So this, this strikes uh, said, it strikes Perl Pi. Uh, it turns out that C++ is not a regular language, right? For whichever <laughs> definition of regular you choose to use. Um, so you can't actually apply regular expressions to uh, C++. For, okay, so for simple stuff, maybe you can get away with it. But for large stuff at the scales that we're talking about, it is just not feasible. Um, and you'll see why in, in a minute. Um, you can't actually do this by IDE either. Uh, mostly because IDEs run on your client, they work on very small subsets of stuff, and in order to be able to do these refactorings, you have to be able to do refactor all of the things right, in a fairly short amount of time. Um, so instead of, so an IDE just doesn't cut it. Right? You just can't use an IDE to, to, to work at this scale. Um, it's just too slow. Right? So instead of all these solutions, what we really need is a more elegant tool for a more refined age, right? <laughs> um, and yes, I did just mix a Star Trek metaphor with a Star Wars metaphor. I expect the universe to end shortly, um, right? So first, we need to generate the change, right, in our, in our step here. Um, and the way that we do that, or so recall our initial example, right? All the big Fs to all the little Fs. Um, you can't use this, do regular expressions here, right? Or just pattern matching because you can envision a lot of places where the term file is used in a context other than this, right? This is not an uncommon term in a code base as large as ours or even as small as yours, right? Um, and I don't mean that in a derogatory sense. Uh, sorry. Um, so there, uh, anyway, I won't. Um, but, but there, you just can't use uh, you know, search and replace on the word file, right? You have to use something a little more um, interesting, right? Or this transformation. Um, so we use a tool we, like to, we call ClangMR. Uh, you can actually read about this in ICSME from a couple years ago. There's a more formal paper there. Um, but this is, this is ClangMR, and ClangMR is essentially Clang plus MapReduce, right? So uh, Clang is the hammer for all of our nails these days. Um, and it provides the library infrastructure, the AST node matching um, abilities, so we can match the AST nodes, traverse them, do interesting stuff there. Um, and then MapReduce is our highly parallelized framework, right? This is not a new thing. Um, there are open source implementations such as Hadoop, right? You can envision taking the MapReduce infrastructure, or the, the Clang infrastructure that we're talking about here and plugging it on top of um, Apache Hadoop and getting a similar type of system as I'm going to be describing. So this is ClangMR. Right? So this is all that it is. Right? This is a, uh, the input is our C++ code. Um, the output is a bunch of modified code. Right? So the first thing we're, do we're doing here, the C++ code every night runs through an indexer. Uh, all of our source code gets built, and the output of that is, a, among other things, a compilation index that describes, so it's not the actual ASTs of the code, because those are really big, and they take forever to get out of storage. So it's actually a list of steps needed to reproduce the AST. Uh, that goes into an index, right? Uh, and then there's this node transformation, node matching transformation tool. This is actually the only piece of code that is written by the person doing the actual transformation. All the rest of this infrastructure is provided for free if you're, if you're building a, a refactoring tool, right? This is a tool that is built on top of Clang. It uses Clang, Clang's AST matching infrastructure. And what it does is it allows us to write code that matches specific nodes in the AST, which then invokes a callback that we can then use to edit the, the source code, or edit the code um, that we're trying to refactor. This code, it's, this tool itself is actually written in C++, and it has full access to the AST that, that Clang has at that point in the compilation process, which means you can do interesting things, like examine the arguments, right? Look at what kind of 
argument is, is this a string literal argument? Is it a variable? What is the name of the variable, right? Because if your variable names have meaning um, per style recommendations, you can actually uh, you can actually use that information in these types of tools. Um, how many variables are there? Uh, what is you know, anything that you can get from the AST? You can get in this in this type of tool. Um, the problem is that you have to know the AST, and so there's actually a significant learning curve to implementing even this bit. Um, this is an example of the various matchers that are available as part of Clang's uh, infrastructure, right? So you can see like there's just, do you want to match a decal, right? There you go. Uh, any type of AST node that you have, you can match, and this is uh, the way that you do it. Um, so going back to our file example, right? So this. Uh, is a statement matcher that matches the call expression, right? That with a call e that has a function decal that has the name of file join path. Now this almost looks like Lisp, right? Because um, of all the parentheses. But uh, this will create a node. So that top node then we can use in our second matcher, which says, "Give me all the callees that have this name that don't have a." any of their arguments have the same function call, right? In other words, don't give me any nested versions of file join path. I can handle those in a separate pass, um, but only give me the actual calls that don't have a nested call, right? So the AST matchers give us this ability to do logical traversal among the AST, um, and then eventually we can bind it to something interesting, to a, to a name, and then tell, uh, tell the infrastructure to invoke a certain callback when we get that, right? What does the callback look like? Well, this is a very, very simplistic version of a callback. Right? We can pull the node that we're interested in out of the, of the results that we get. Right? We create some state object that stores a bunch of our, our changes. Um, we can then look at that argument right? and then perform argument-specific behavior. I, I emitted lots of the argument-specific behavior here because uh, some, lots of it's boilerplate. But you can envision things like uh, if, the ob if the argument is a literal and the first character in that literal is not a slash, then I know for certain that they did not intend to use the absolute version of the new API. Right? Am I following? Right? This is, OK, all the heads are going like this, which means you're either falling asleep or you're actually following. Um, right? So you can ask questions like this in these tools and get, and get useful answers. Right? At some point, I can't tell, I can't read minds of the people that wrote the code. Um, and so at some point you have to make intelligent guesses, you know, heuristics, and that's what you can do here. So, so some, sometimes you can actually do this with certainty, sometimes you have to use heuristics. Um, but we can get pretty close uh, with this type of thing. Um, so you plug all that into the refactoring MapReduce, right, um, that maps your source code index to a set of edits that come out of that, that index, right? Um, those edits are then applied to the local client using a source code, yeah, a, essentially a glorified version of patch. Uh, it's not actually patch, but um, it's essentially taking a set of a diff and applying it to your local client. And at that point, you have a change with uh, a, a client with all the changes that you've intended to make. Right? Um, so step 1.5 in all of this, incidentally, is format the code. Uh, the biggest problem that prevented us from doing a lot of these transformations was the fact that people didn't like looking at the results of the transformation. Right? Um, humans are going to have to read this code again. And having the ability to read that code is really important for them, which means that the robot that's making this change needs to be able to format the code in a way that the person reading it will be able to read it. Right? Ideally, they don't actually know that we've been in there messing with their code. Right. We'd like this process to be as smooth as possible. Um, and part of that is having really good formatting. Um, we do that using Clang Format. If you're not using Clang Format, go use it. Right? It makes automated tooling like this a lot easier. It, like, just possible. Right? Not even just easier, but possible. Um, so reformat your code. Or reformatting the code is an important step there. Uh, the next step in this process is to shard the change and to test it. Right? So if I have a change that changes 50,000 files or more, right, 
I can't actually submit that in one go to the version control repository, right? Uh, with 4,000 developers mutating the repository on a regular basis, I'm going to get enough merge conflicts that I can't actually submit that change in one pass, right? It's just, it's just not even possible, right? Like, you can't, the physics does not allow it, right? Um, and if you manage to break the laws of physics and get this submitted, right, what if you have to roll it back? Right? You feel unlucky twice? Uh, if you are, please buy my next lottery ticket, right? Because this just is not going to happen. Um, you have to be able to uh, be able to account for those scenarios. And part of that is sharding this into smaller changes that you can test independently, you can submit independently, you can manage independently. Um, we have a tool to do that. Uh, I won't go into too much depth here other, other than to say um, it makes these, it makes the submission process easier. It also makes testing easier, incidentally, because if you find a bug, you have a small set of change, a small change that you know caused the bug or the test failure, as opposed to a very large change that caused the test failure. So it helps you to isolate test failures and fix those as needed. Um, so reviewing each shard, right? So after you've uh, created the shard, you've submitted it, you tested it, you think it's okay, it still has to be reviewed, right? Um, it still has to be reviewed to make sure it's correct. The way that we do this is, of course, robots, right? We have a robot creating the change, we have a robot reviewing the change, like what could go wrong? Um, <laughs> right? So uh, this usually goes to someone that has privileges to uh, change any portion of the code tree, uh, and they have a set of scripts that are independent of the scripts that generated the change, that then review the change for content, make sure that the, con the, the change, each part of the change matches some predefined pattern, uh, and that that's correct, right? If, it's not able to, if for some reason the change doesn't match what they're expecting, the script can then kick out to the human and say, hey, this is something you may take a look at, right? It may be a bad format, it may be a bona fide bug, right? There's all kinds of reasons there. Um, it, this review tool actually doesn't have to be that smart because um, this is kind of like an NP problem, right? It's easy to, it's hard to generate the change, it's actually easy to verify that it's correct. And so this tool can be something pretty simple. Um, and then submit the change to the version control system, right? And then we're done. Uh, not so much. So there are some problems with this idealized view of the world. Um, one of them, excuse me, one of them is the fact that people like to write flaky tests. Uh, or rather, they don't like to fix flaky tests. A flaky <laughs> test is a test that fails intermittently with, you know, presumably under the same, same, uh, same set of running conditions, right? Uh, and when you're running lots of tests, you have no idea if your change caused those failures or if it's just a flaky test, right? Um, so we have to work around those. So the fast moving code base actually causes a lot of problems too. Um, I mentioned the ability to, just the ability to submit is impeded by a fast moving code base. Uh, the fact that there are a lot of people making a lot of edits means you actually get a non-trivial amount of manual merge conflicts that you have to re resolve. Uh, and the fact that the end game here for removing an API usually turns into a giant game of whack-a-mole because somebody is adding the API at the same time you're trying to, trying to remove it, right? And so what you need is tools to prevent people from adding new calls to the API while you're trying to remove calls to the API. Um, at the end of the day, I actually don't feel bad about breaking people, okay? Um, and, and I'll explain this, right? So it's a build break, number one. Right? So it's not like it's a production failure, unless your production system requires your compiler to return zero. I mean, I, in which case, you've got other problems. Um, but it's a, so it's a build break. I don't have any problem doing that. Number two, if, there, if, if the call was introduced in the last couple of weeks, then, you know, they're at, or the last couple of days, rather, then they're actually active, main, actively maintaining this code. And so I don't feel any problem having them maintain it one more time. Uh, and finally, like, if I break their build and they didn't have a test on it, right, that is their problem and it is not mine, right? Um, again, I, I preface this by saying this presupposes that you have a good testing culture, right? Uh, if you have somehow evaded my testing um, in our big giant continuous integration system, right, that actually turns out to not be my problem. Um, I have very little sympathy for, for that, that type of behavior. Um, and it should only happen once, incidentally, because uh, after that, you should put a test on your thing and then I won't break you again. Uh, but You'd be surprised at how many people think that that is my problem. Um, 
So the other thing I mentioned earlier, right, so the correct transformation is not always known. We actually don't always know, and tests do not always catch, right, whether the, the transformation that we're trying to make is actually the right one to, to make. Um, in that case, we actually have to involve human reviewers, uh, and human reviewers actually turn out to be fallible, uh, contrary to popular belief, right? And we have to get, uh, that involves turnaround time, it actually slows this whole process down, right? So we have to get people involved, um, and that, that can add latency to the, to the process, which kind of drags everything on out. Um, so in the minutes, time that I've left, I want to talk, talk about a couple of these large-scale transformations. So I talked about the file join path issue. Um, that actually turned out reasonably well. Uh, we didn't hurt too many people with that one. Um, so, but I'd like to talk about a couple that may be a little bit more applicable to the scenarios you're in, right? So uh, for a long time, Google has had a type called uh, shared pointer because you know that's a useful idiom so useful that they actually standardized it in C++ 11 right so we would very much like to get off of the one that we wrote and get on to the one that is in the standard so sounds easy doesn't it that's a trick question these things are never easy right um, so what worked in this scenario what we did is we made the old class look as much as possible like the standardized one Right? That meant changing uh, implementation details that differed, and then finding, using the testing system, finding out what broke, going and fixing those people that were changing, depending upon those implementation details, right? and then actually submitting that implementation detail to the, to the repository. Right? Once we got to the point that the old implementation was a strict subset of the new implementation, we then had a very, very scary moment where we type deft the new type to the existing one, right? This is the equivalent of like a flag flip, right? From going from NCP to TCP, right? I mean, this is a change that impacted the entire code base all at once, and we really weren't sure how this was gonna turn out, right? Um, you test and you test and you test, but as we all know, test coverage isn't totally complete. We just really weren't sure how this was gonna turn out, um, and we got really, really lucky on this. Uh, this actually worked. Um, sometimes you can yank the tablecloth off the table and nobody knows, right? Um, that's actually what happened here. We got really, really lucky. Uh, and then it was just a matter of using uh, Clang MR to add the STD prefix everywhere, reformat, and, and declare victory. So uh, today in Google, we're using the uh, standard shared pointer um, in almost all cases, right? Uh, what was important about being able to do that, incidentally, is when you have a type like this that spans in an API boundary, uh, which shared pointer often is, right? You're returning a shared pointer, you're passing a shared pointer into a method. Uh, you have to then update all the callers at the same time you're updating the API. I mean, things get, get a little bit more involved. And that's what happened as part of our unique pointer migration, right? So the other thing that happened here, or the other experience that we had, uh, is that we moved from scope pointer to unique pointer. So scope pointer, was, is a type that looks and smells and behaves almost like a unique pointer, except it's not movable, can't use it in standard types, like standard containers, right? Um, it had slight behavioral differences, uh, right? So what happens today when you have a unique pointer that points to an object and you call reset on that unique pointer with the same object? Does anyone know? Right? Good, it's bad behavior, don't even do that, right? But it is defined. Um, scope pointer actually did something different, right? People were depending upon this, right? Uh, so this is what this transformation looks like. Pretty simple. Um, people were actually like depending upon this, um, this behavior, right? Uh, among other things, right? There are also other interesting behaviors, right? This actually leads to Hiram's first rule of interface design, and given sufficient use, right, there actually isn't any such thing as a private interface, right? Somebody somewhere, if your API is being used hundreds of thousands of times, somebody somewhere is depending upon the implementation detail of that API. Like, you can't do anything about that. They are, whether it's by accident or by intent, <laughs> Right? They're depending upon the implementation detail, and because of that, right, you have to take that into account as part of your migration plan. Um, 
And so we did, right? Uh, right there. So we did. Um, we had to fix those differences using our testing platform to determine where those, uh, those problems were, uh, update the people that depended upon them, uh, give them the tools they needed, or build, in some cases, actually build tools to migrate people to, the, to, a better, to fix their problem. Um, we actually had, so I mentioned scope pointer in here. There was actually a scope pointer scoped array, which was for arrays, scoped pointer malloc, which is if you wanted to use malloc in your backend instead of scope pointer, right? Um, and figuring out how to migrate all those was, was hard. Uh, there was, all, we actually ended up updating um, scope pointer to be a, to accept arrays and a custom deleter and all this stuff, like look and smell like you would expect unique pointer to look like. Moved all of the scoped arrays, all the scoped mallocs to use scope pointers. So then when we ran the big conversion, we could just convert scope pointer as having to, instead of having to do two steps in one. Um, so a APIs spanning boundaries are, n or the uses spanning API boundaries were not independent, right? So people that were using code that was using a scope pointer in an API, right? You couldn't return a scope pointer because it wasn't a movable type. But you and and, and you, it wasn't copy, it wasn't copyable either. I don't think. Um, and you couldn't, <laughs> but you could use one as an output parameter, right? And that's what everyone did. So once that happens, you've introduced a bunch of coupling between uh, your callers and the API itself. Uh, and so we had to work around that. The way that we worked around that was that when we initially sharded these into small chunks, we sharded on package boundaries, right? With or on, on project boundaries with the intention that, or with the hope, hope is, hope is not a strategy, incidentally. Um, <laughs> but it was ours at this time. Um, so with the hope that there weren't as many a, uh, API boundaries between projects, or API crossings between projects as there were within a project. So if we migrated a single project altogether, we wouldn't run into this as often. Um, that turned out to be an optimistic assumption. Uh, and so there was actually a lot of manual bit twiddling to, to and ma by manual I mean Hiram looking at the test failures, seeing build breakages, going in and manually either adding an appropriate override or updating the caller somewhere else that wasn't part of the original change or you know, reverting the specific line that was failing on the bit. I mean, there was a lot of manual stuff involved with there, right? Um, the solution to this, incidentally, is better data flow analysis across packages. Uh, since ClangMR only works on single translation units, it doesn't have the ability to look at, uh, to look across translation units to make kind of decisions about, I should edit this thing at the same time I'm editing that thing over there. And how we're, we need to build that ability because um, we're starting to run into that occasionally as well in, as this demonstrated, right? Um, there was a lot of code that was still being built using C++ 11 tool, non-C++ 11 tool chains, right? So if you have co code that's being built on a platform that isn't part of the main Google tool chain, right? Um, then you can't migrate from scope pointer to unique pointer because it just doesn't have unique pointer available, right? Well, how do you discover that this code is being built? Um, there are a couple of ways. One way is to uh, for them to tell you a priori, right? This is what we'd hope ha would happen. Um, again, that's not a strategy. Uh, the other way is to actually make the change and see that their tests are failing because you know, the tool chain is in the test is trying to build. And the third way is to actually submit the change and then wait for them to come back to you like days later and say, you broke us in strange ways. Please don't do that anymore. Um, and that's actually what happened more often than not. And so it turns out that we actually do have a more complete list now of the things that are uh, building on non-C++11 tool chains because we used this as a discovery exercise for that, that condition. Um, <laughs> so the final one that was, that was hard, right? So up until this point, you can say, I know it's a big problem. I know that uh, I'm going to have lots of these pointers uh, that I need to convert, right? Scope pointer is hopefully a fairly unique name in the code base. Why can't I still use you know, my textual-based tools? If it wasn't for the scale, why can't I use the text-based the text tools? Uh, and that's where, so point four there is where ClangMR really helped, right? So, there were actually, there's actually several versions of scope pointer defined in our code base, right? I don't know why, but there are, right? Sometimes it ships as part of an open source project, sometimes it, you know, whatever reason, right? But we only wanted to migrate the canonical one, right? 
How do you tell by looking at a single variable reference whether that refers to the canonical version or whether it refers to some other version somewhere, right? Um, the way that we do it is because we have in the AST, right, we know where that symbol is declared, right? We can just look that up as part of the source code information and say, is it declared in some file that we know we're expecting it to be declared in? If it is, then we can go ahead with the transformation. If it isn't, then we ignore it, right? You don't have that information without looking at the AST. Right? You can't do it if you're not using a compiler-based tool. Right? This is the type of thing where Clangamar um, really shines. Uh, we have found in, in building these tools that scale, and incidentally, I haven't built any of them. I just use them. Um, so I'm, give, I'm taking credit for a lot of people that have done a lot of other work besides me. But we have found that building these tools uh, is not possible without using the compiler. Right? At some point, you need to use the information that the compiler gives you. You, can, you cannot ignore that information. You cannot uh, use just strict, as I mentioned, textual means. Like You have to use the information the compiler gives you. Um, and Clang actually turns out to be a great compiler for giving you that information. So that's why this is built on top of Clangamar, or on top of Clang. All right, so, essentially, so the end story here is that refactoring at scale is, it's hard, right? This is something that takes uh, a lot of effort to build out the tooling. Um, I spend a lot of my time every day, part of it's working with other teams to help them realize that they, there's some effort on their end, but I spend a lot of my time every day like working around the deficiencies in our tooling and in our code base, right, to get this tooling to work. Um, but it has to be done, right? This is an existential issue. Like if you can't move your code base forward, you are stuck. And this is how we've solved this problem, or solved the easy bits of this problem. There is still a lot of problem left to be solved, to be sure, right? Um, but this is how we've solved the easy bits of that problem. So uh, with that, I will take questions. So um, please use the mics. And yep. I'm still not an astronaut, incidentally. But I do take my kids to go fire model rockets. So that's kind of fun. Uh, please. So when you, when you start off with a a sort of list like a refactoring you want to do or whatever, do you run a kind of speculative, um, what, what matches this rule? And then you have the set of all the things that match that rule and then you say, like for your, your scope pointer, I found all the scope pointers in this case or whatever. And then you have this whole other set of things that, that didn't match or whatever. And then you have to go through all these different cases and yeah. figure out all the bad ways people did stuff with scope pointer. So, right. so, so the way this usually boils down is that, so we can use things like Kyth, like our, our global index, to say how many scope pointers are being used, right? That question is actually fairly easy to answer. Um, and usually the way this tool, building these types of tools boils down is you, you look at the 100 different uses. What's the common pattern there? I'll build a tool to transform that common pattern to what my target pattern, okay? You step back and, and you, you run with that, right? And maybe that covers 98% of your cases, right? And then once that's done, it's like you've, you've gotten rid of all of that, and then you look, do that again, right? Okay, now I only have you know, 2,000 people left, 2,000 callers left, like what's the most common case, right? Um, and so it is this iterative process. Uh, you could do it a priori, like you could build a tool that handled all the cases. Um, it's just really hard, in my experience, to ferret out those low priority cases, or those, those low occurrence cases. Um, the other side to this is that your tool does not have to be perfect, perfect, right? The stuff that you give to end users should be perfect, but if I have a tool that, if I've got, you know, 50,000 callers to something, and I have a tool that is 99.99% perfect, right, I can handle those last 50 instances by hand. Like, it doesn't have to be perfect in every single case. Um, and so what we're trying to do is get to the point at which it's now manageable by a human. Uh, and so, yeah, it's very iterative in terms of like looking at how are people using this and, and going on from there. So, please. So it sounds great for refactorings. I'm sure you employ this to do other things like uh, static analysis or enforcement of your coding conventions, anything like that. Do you do you do that actively? Yeah. So uh, the infrastructure that matches the pat mat the, the pattern matching is actually the same infrastructure that is used in Clang Tidy. Uh, and Clang Modernize, I believe, is built upon that, on top of that. Um, and we, we surface uh, those things as part of our code review process to say, like, 
hey, you're using it. We, we have cleaned up all these anti-patterns. Like, you are trying to introduce a new one. Don't do that, right? Um, and we've actually gotten to the point where people can uh, run, I mentioned refactorings. So refact some refactorings we don't do because they're just, they're low enough, the cost benefit just isn't there. But we can build a code review plugin that identifies those cases. And then we can actually let teams self-service go run the refactoring on their own code tree, right? If you're tired of seeing this in your code review, like just go run it over all of your project code and then you won't see it anymore. Like it's not cost benefit, it's not, the benefit isn't there for us to do it across all of the code base, but we can let teams do it independently. And that's all using the same infrastructure. So, please. Uh, uh, two things. Uh, one was uh, maybe kind of do the last thing. Uh, how do you figure out the cost benefit of, um, you know, why do you decide to do the changes that you do? And, uh, and then if you could talk a little bit more about how you decided to do the sharding. Uh, that was kind of interesting because I've run into similar problems. So how we decide to do the changes that we do. Um, this actually involves a lot of smoke and mirrors and hand waving and stuff. Um, and that's being generous. Uh, right, so we actually run uh, biennial surveys of our, of our users saying what stinks in the code base, how can we make it better? Um, that's one way we get a lot of feedback. Um, we identify APIs that are being used heavily, that are be, being used poorly, that we should provide new APIs for. Um, lots of this is actually dedupe, right? It's, we have a new API, an old one that does the same thing, but is a poorer API, and we want to get rid of that thing, right? Move people over. Um, the standard actually prompted, or C++11 actually prompted a lot of this, because we'd had idioms that kind of did what stuff now in C++11 does. Um, that we want to get rid of, so like you know, like scope pointer, um, and yeah, that that makes sense to do. Uh, there's actually a group of so anyone at, so this this tool isn't isn't limited to like my team or people on my team, right? This is like a tool that anyone at Google could use, um, and there's actually a group of us that represent different areas of the company that review uh, large changes every week. Right? So someone wants to make a very large change, if it's going to impact more than you know, a, a several dozen size you know, people in the company, then they write up a one page proposal, half of which is just boilerplate, uh, send it to the, the review committee and we look at it and say, yep, you're doing the right thing. Or in the case of the British, English to, British spelling to English American spelling, we say, Probably better, you know, probably other things that are more important, right? Um, it's just a sanity check to make sure they thought through the change and that, that we thought through the change. But okay. um, hopefully these changes are painless enough for the people receiving them that it's more the cost of, the, the person bearing the cost of the person doing the work to generate the changes, right? That's the goal. Um, not always the case, but that's the goal. And then your question about sharding. Uh, yeah, I'm, I don't know, it took really long. <laughs> no, no, that's okay, I like to talk. Um, so sharding. Sharding is, uh, stop you. <laughs> we have a tool that will essentially uh, use heuristics to determine which, where project boundaries are. Um, and by default, it shards on project boundaries. You can also set it to other kind of modes. Um, uh, at some point, we'll actually like, properly describe this tool in some kind of paper or talk or something, so I don't want to get too far into it. Um, but it, it essentially manages the, here's a big set of changes, chop it up into little pieces, test all the pieces independently, and then wait for somebody to review them, monitor for that feedback, and then when the review comes in, if it's an approval, then do the submission. Do you normally find the sharding then doesn't work like on a compiler sort of basis? Like usually you just get a bunch of compiler fails and you go, oh, okay, I'll move. Uh, yeah, it seems like you'd have to do duplication and, and you know, do it on this side of the interface and that side of the Yeah, interface. so the sharding kind of presupposes that changes are, are, are uh, independent, or are largely independent, right? Okay. And that's what this API boundary issue was, is because uh, when we had API or changes that impacted API boundaries, right? Then we did. You know, you have a shard that's not independent of some other shard somewhere. You run the compiler on it as part of the testing process, and it says you know, nothing built. And then you have to go look at that manually. Right. Um, we're we're working. So the sharding tool, we're working to improve it to the point that you can suggest alternate sharding strategies. Um, we don't have that yet. I see. So you'd probably try and turn it into a non-problem somehow to yes. work across the boundary and yeah. then unshard it later or something if you could. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a lot of, like, there's still a lot of human intervention and manual finagling going on there. Cool. Right, so. Actually, my question was exactly on that, so thanks. So it's sharding and breaking interface, and so. Yeah, yeah. and the sharding tool, 
limits the number of changes in flight, I should also mention, right? So if you have, you know, if the shard is, if, if the big change is going to be smit, or split into a thousand separate sub-changes, uh, and there's only 200 in flight at a time, right? You can see how that would increase latency depending upon how fast people are reacting to the, I mean, there's all kinds of interesting patterns that pop up in terms of like, how fast is the testing infrastructure reacting to the changes that you send out? How fast are people responding to them? Oh, there's, you know, somebody that just created a merge conflict. I mean, there's all kinds of interesting inf in interactions that go on there. Please. Uh, so we were walk, uh, working with some Google code, actually Chromium code, and uh, periodically we uh, pull new changes from the Chromium repository. And from that to time we see, oh, they made a huge refactoring. And now our code doesn't compile against their code because they've changed some methods. Uh, and then we have to manually fix our side of the code so mm -hmm. that it works with, with Chromium. Do you think it's possible that you will uh, release this tool and, uh, you know, push the scripts that generate the refactoring so that uh, other users of, of the code can, can run them? So you'd probably actually have to go bug the Chromium people about that. <laughs> um, the, the tool, so the stuff that's happening, the stuff that we're, so, let me step back. The stuff that I'm doing is largely to internal users, right? External users will never see it. Um, the tool, the infrastructure itself does run on the Chromium repository. Like, so the Chromium folks can actually run this tool on their, their stuff. Um, and the infrastructure, as I mentioned, the MapReduce infrastructure that we're using, right, that's all Google specific. Uh, it doesn't make any sense for us to release that because there's already open source implementations and whatnot. Um, it's certainly feasible to release the AST matching type of, you know, here is, the, here is the tool that we built on top of the AST matcher. Like, go figure out how to run it across all the code base on your own. Like, that's certainly reasonable to do. Um, if that's how they're generating the changes, and I don't know that that's how they are, um, it'd be worth asking them to, to do that. Yes? Do you have to worry about uh, collisions between ASDs that look the same but actually mean different things? Uh, what do you mean? Uh, like if uh, you had two definitions of function foo that takes int in two compilation units that are private, but they mean totally different things. So if they're, so first of all, if you do have that and they're going to get compiled into the same thing, you've got an ODR violation, um, which is bad. Um, but largely, I'm looking at stuff that's common across all of Google, right? So if it's a single method in a single file, right, this falls into the, that's not even refactoring, just do it once and move on, right? Um, the stuff I'm looking at is stuff that's like across the entire code base. Oh, what if there's a what if what if there is a name collision, yeah. right? Then yeah, you've your program is not well formed, and I don't have any pity on you. <laughs> um, no, because like you have it is an ODR violation, right? And we actually have tools now that check for ODR violations, so like that'll get flagged. But um, if you have a method that's named something and it's the same as in some common library somewhere, then you got a problem. Please. Uh, do you have do you find that you have to deal sometimes with uh, binary incompatibility that uh, are introduced by uh, the sharding method? So because stuff is independent, so um, all those developers working in this one monolithic code base are all building from head, so we don't really have an ABI problem mm -hmm. um, because they're all rebuilding you know their production binaries from whatever's in the code but base at a given snapshot in time. Can something, some, one, one thing can be built and then some other is not built, yet built? So that's why the, having independent changes is important, right? right? Every shard must compile and pass testing and be able to be submitted independently before it gets submitted, mm -hmm. right? Um, that, and that does limit the types of changes you can do, right? Because you can envision a type of change in which you want to change everything and there's all kinds of interdependencies and those are hard. Uh, not hard as in this kind of hard, like there you are, hard with a capital H. Uh, and we're still working on the best way to do those. Fortunately, there are enough problems to be solved with these kinds of tools that we haven't had a need yet to, to get that far down the road. Thank you. Um, but yeah, it's a valid question. Hi. Um, I work for a hedge fund in Los Angeles. Um, we have 20 years worth of legacy code, trading strategies which trade hundreds of thousands of you know, contracts across the world. Um, the legacy code based uh, used time as UN64, which is uh, you know microseconds since epoch. Now we wanted, for performance reasons, we wanted to switch it to nanoseconds since epoch, but the data type stays the same. It's UN64. The problem is all our unit tests are designed to treat it as microseconds since epoch. So we don't have a set of unit tests which will now tell us that whether it 
break, you know, the new code breaks or works. Is it an impossible task to refactor uh. manually? <laughs> You've got all the money in the world, right? You're a hedge fund. <laughs> um, right? Just shave a couple of pennies off every, no. Um, so uh, it's hard to answer that question without looking at your specific use case. Um, a tool like this would help you do refactoring across your entire, entire code base um, to the extent that it is possible to do that type of change, right? Um, if you're talking about updating tests test expectations based upon a change in some file somewhere. Um, you could certainly build multiple tools. If the test expectations fit a certain pattern, right, you could certainly build multiple tools. You ran across the same code base simultaneously and you know, spit those out, right? Um, I, you know, I had here a single matcher, right? You can actually have multiple matchers that, in, that are invoked on multiple different trans, you know, types of AS, AST nodes, like all as part of the same tool. Um, and that may be a, an avenue to explore in, in, type, in your, your scenario. Um, but yeah, that sounds like an interesting problem. Good luck when 20, uh, does, this, does this avoid the 2037 problem? Fair enough, fair enough. All right, uh, any other questions? I've probably gone beyond my time limit, either that or you're really hungry. So. Uh, thank you very much, and I'll be around all week. Uh, you feel free to email me as well. We, I like to talk about this stuff, um, so thank you very much.